Yikes, I don't like the weather Friday morning. It is April 19th of 2024. Welcome to Foundations. Um, I have a perfect view from where I sit each week, looking right out in the window to see the marvelous weather that is going on outside the doors of our office. And um, boy, this morning is just bleak looking. It's, yeah, yep, yep. I'm not a rain fan. I'd like to have, have rain only at one time between midnight and three every night. Um, I don't know anybody that plays golf at that time, so it should be just fine for it to rain then. So that way it leaves the daytime for keeping up with uh, mowing the grass and it leaves daytimes for um, nice walks in the sunshine or even walks on a cloudy day. And of course, golf. <laughs> Why would you not want to play golf? Come on, All right? Those who know me know that I love golf. Um, I love golf, even though I can't play golf. It's kind of crazy. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. It'd be really nice to have a 12 to 3, you know, midnight to 3 a.m. You know, rain shower every night. Next day is nice and sunny, warm. Yeah. Well, we well, didn't tune in this morning to hear me talk about golf or the weather, and I didn't get up this morning to prepare for this to tell you just about golf and the weather. So. Um, we're going to take a few minutes this morning and do exactly what we do every Friday morning. We're going to spend some time building the foundation of our faith, which is in Christ only, as we walk each and every day in the uh, obedience and uh, call of the Holy Spirit and Christ's salvation in our life. So, yep, so let me jump in. I want to get a question out of the way so we can jump into today's lessons. If you've not seen, today we're going to talk about the 90-10 rule. We'll get there in just a moment. Before that... Answer this below and let me know what you think. And I've had all kinds of food cooked outdoors. These are the three types of food cooking methods. What is your favorite? Do you like a gas grill? Or do you like charcoal? Or do you like a wood cooking? Now, wood cooking could be smoking, using chips, things of that nature. It could be open fire. Which of the three do you like taste-wise for your meat to be cooked do you like it cooked on a gas grill, on charcoal, or wood? What is your preference for barbecue? And the reason I ask that question is obvious. Spring has sprung. It is getting warmer, despite the fact that it's not really warm this morning. And soon, if not already, I have already had the grill fired up. Soon, if not uh, already, we are grilling, and uh, we are cooking what we enjoy on the grill. So... Answer, if you would, please comment down below. Let me know. Do you like gas, charcoal, or wood? What is your preference in your cooking method for barbecue? So, so let's jump in. And this morning, I apologize. I'm not going to be reading an exact passage. But I did want to just mention Ecclesiastes chapter 4, where it says that God has written eternity on their hearts, on human hearts. And then Colossians chapter 1, I talked about last week, um, where that it says that Paul's desire was that they would know the will of God they would know the heart of God and would live in it in Colossians chapter 1. So I want to take the time this morning and really jump in and really, really, really pour into the 90-10 rule so that you can begin to, to map out consistently with a compass in hand what direction God wants for your life, all right? So the 90-10 rule is what I say basically is, is what it is as far as God's will or God's heart for our life. 90% of which I believe wholeheartedly is already known. And that 10% of it, or the 10, is what we seek. The problem is this, is that oftentimes we spend more time on the 10 and spend very little time on the 90. See, one of the reasons I've been involved in teaching ministry over the years is that it is my desire, first of all, to use what God has given me as talents to serve him. But in the grand scheme of things, I've always been a person who others have looked to for guidance, advice, directions for their life. I've always been in what you might consider to be a management or advisory role in my jobs or in my church. And I was born for whatever reason with some type of sort of leadership built in. I'm not sure why. Can't take credit for it. Didn't ask for it. I didn't actually seek it per se. I, did, I, I found myself wanting to be in charge occasionally, couldn't figure out what it was, and it felt awkward sometimes to want to be in charge. And so as a result, I've just ended up there. 
kind of like God's call on my life. It is the 10%. We'll talk more about that 10% next week. It began years ago, and I didn't ask for it, nor have I developed it. I do consider it God's call on my life, and as a result, it has led me into full-time ministry. Now, I'm done with the, the, the 10% part for this week, and I, I will talk more about it last week. It's something that I, I think God has developed in my life and continues to develop in my life, and that's how I fit in the body of Christ. I could have been a carpenter, and God could have used that talent for his kingdom instead of using the leadership uh, talent that he gave me. You see, the 10% or 10% of God's heart for your life or will may be to be in ministry like me, or it may be that you could use that gift someplace else. For instance, my gift was used for 18 years in retail. And I didn't think of it as any less of a gift to be in leadership there as I think of my gift now. It's not less of a gift. It was the season of life God had me in as he was making me a leader. And one thing I want to emphasize here is that 10% and most likely will be, but, you know, most likely will be the same as someone else's 10%. It's not the same as everyone else's, though. And that's what makes us individuals, and that's what makes us God's people. And what, again, I say is, is that we oftentimes seek the 10%. We talk about God's will. I want to know God's will, and we're always talking about the 10%. We're rarely looking at the 90%. It has been my, God, my goal to let, use God's talents that he has put on my life to honor him, to find God's heart, not my heart, not some preacher's heart, not some prophet's heart, not some holy man's heart, not the words of a prophet, priest, or preacher. It has been my goal to spend time with God so that I would know his heart for me. Like I said, we'll talk more about the 10% next week in our lesson called niche. What is your niche? So well, what is most powerful here, and I think what is most amazing, is that there is so much more to knowing God's heart than that little bitty sliver or 10% of your life. As a matter of fact, the rest of the week has all kinds of opportunities for God's heart to be flowing through your life in an everyday setting. See, following Jesus and finding the heart of God is actually plastered all over the place. It is everywhere you look. I guarantee you it is everywhere you look. And we have just gotten in such a, we've gotten such a sales job from people like me in a pulpit or me in a Sunday school class or someone on television or someone you've listened to, someplace you've gone to church. And as a result of all of our yapping and blabbing, we've spent so much time trying to drill you with the 10% which most times, listen to me, most times benefits the one speaking, okay? When a pastor, please hang on, when a pastor preacher preaches about a particular topic, it's usually something on his heart he doesn't feel like he can do and wants someone else to do. I'm not picking. You know, we hear people talk about, you know, well, God wants you to be in ministry. He wants you to just, well, that's all fine and dandy to talk about those things, but oftentimes it is seeking your heart and help to get done what the person talking wants to get accomplished. Not all the time, I get it. But I'm telling you, the reason why pastors talk about the pool, uh, talk about the nursery is because nobody's there, okay? That's why they get all fired up about someone working with the kids. It's because no one's working with the kids. And so if you're not careful, especially in a small church, people like me, we can drill you pretty hard and make you feel guilty so you'll jump up and do something that has nothing to do with God's heart for your life. So be careful. Do not let some preacher, prophet, or priest. Don't let some book that's written with a bunch of emotions. And listen, I enjoy all of that. I enjoy preachers, prophets, and priests. I enjoy books. I enjoy music, all those things. But I have to be willing to set aside my own desires to see what God wants as his heart for my life. And I believe wholeheartedly that unlike the 10%, which I share with a small group of people, the 90% I share with everybody listening and anybody and everybody who will ever hear my voice say the words I'm saying right now. You and I share 90% of God's will. That's right. 90% of God's heart is the same for every one of us. And unfortunately, like I've said, someone has taken us out in the woods and dropped us off and has not told us how to get back home. 
like I said, pastor, uh, pastor, preacher, teacher. Listen, they only have impact in your life most times one day a week. So the question is, who's going to have impact the rest of it? If you have no way to know God's heart for your life apart from someone speaking to you and telling you, then you're going to basically be feeling lost all the time, which you already may. You may feel like, well, I can't get it right. I do this, it doesn't work out. I do this, it doesn't work out. Golly me, we fall into these traps. Listen to the first of this series. Talk about the four traps to avoid. We fall in these traps because of people like me who just teach the 10% more often and don't talk about the 90%. And the 90% actually intersects with and informs everybody's heart. And it also informs all the 10%, all of it. The 90% informs, instructs, guides, directs the 10%. You cannot do the 10% godly and rightly without the 90 percent i guarantee you very very clear if you don't have the 90 in control the 10 percent's never going to be in control it might be effective you might be successful but that doesn't mean it's god or god's heart it just doesn't mean it success is not a measuring stick for god's heart it's just not it okay so the cool part is this since all of us have that same 90 percent I believe we can find um, direction, help, guidance that is pretty much similar and then therefore is very common for believers to be able to converse about, to be able to interact with each other about, to actually do some marvelous things by being among one another. And so what I want to do this morning, if the 90% is so clear and what God's heart is is so obvious in so many settings, I want to suggest you five quick ways that you can expose your life to God's heart and be living in his will 90% of the time so that the 10% becomes extremely clear. 90% helps the 10% become clear. Doesn't mean the 10% is always clear. What it means is this, and I believe this to the core of my being, I'll sit down and have a Coke, I'll buy lunch. Call me, text me. I will sit down and talk about this. The 90% is so blasted, clear. I mean, so clear that you can live life and not even fret over the 10%. Not even fret over it. You'll be so tuned into God that you will not have to even sweat the 10%. Then that way, when the 10% becomes clearer and clearer, it's easy for you to just step right on out in faith because you already know you have God's heart you have God's ways inside of you. Five ways you can really drill down and get God's heart for your life. Five things. Number one, read the Bible. As a matter of fact, don't just read the Bible. Read anything you can get to help you understand it. Broaden what you read a little bit. Now, some people are afraid to do this, but I'm telling you, broaden it. Read Pentecostal readings. Read Wesleyan readings. Read Baptist readings. Read whatever Read all these Methodists, read these different read, uh, different um, Bible perspectives, because what's going to happen is this. And you're going to find this to be true about this 90%. Whenever you look at particular denominational teachings, and by the way, non-denomination is a denomination. All right? It just is. You're just not all together in one, one great big body of folks with somebody telling you what to do. All right? Non-denominational churches have just became their own denomination, it seems like. They pretty much operate the same as the denominations. They just took the name off the door. Okay, so when you read the Bible, read other things that help you understand the Bible more. And reading in a broad spectrum then begins to help you to really boil down to what is priority versus what is proximity. Priority is the things that are obvious in every one of them. In other words, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the same across the board for all denominations. If it's not, it's not a denomination of God. Okay, if Christ isn't the center of it, then I don't care what kind of Bible they read or what kind of Bible they talk about. That Bible isn't God's word. Simple as that. It is not inspired by the Holy Spirit if it doesn't have Jesus at its core. Simple as that. John 14 says the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to us and what he taught and continue to reveal Jesus to us. 
Okay. When I say reveal Jesus to us, I'm not talking about like, you know, I get a dream and then I can go out and kill people or something. When I talk about revealing Jesus, I'm talking about through God's word. It said he would remind you of what you've been taught, basically. So through God's word, you can continue to learn about who Jesus Christ is and what it looks like to walk with him each and every day. You see, the God-given opportunity that you have, that many don't in some of the third world countries, is that you can open your Bible any given day. If you live in America, you live in the most blessed, opportunist um, country that there is in the world. And as a result, you can own a Bible and you can open it anytime, anywhere, pretty much that you want. Now, I know there's all kinds of conflict going on right now. And you know, there's always been conflict. It just happens to be a different area and a little more heated in some areas now than it's ever been. Man has always pushed away from God. He's always enjoyed darkness more than light. It's just that right now, America's seeing more of the darkness being loved than we're comfortable with. That's just it. Simple as that. Man isn't any more evil than he's always been. Man has been born sinful ever since the beginning of man, pretty much. Yeah. Once Adam and Eve broke the broke the thing, it's been broke ever since. All right? Man has been born in sin ever since. That's why Jesus came. That's why he's even important to begin with. Read the Bible. If you enjoy reading through the Bible, by all means, do it that way. But let me suggest to you, that if you really want to get the word of God in a way that you just absolutely becomes alive to you. If you really want to drill down into God's heart for your life, then consistently look for passages that deal with what you're dealing with. For an example, if you are dating and you want to know what it looks like, what God wants for marriage, what God wants for sex, the way he wants two human beings to interact with each other. If you want to know more about that, God's got the design there. It's not a question about God's heart for that. It's already obvious. It's already been written down. It's already been given. It is thousands of years old, and it doesn't matter how often you try to change it. It hadn't changed. If you're seeking God about sex before or outside God's design, then it's wrong. That's the 90%. See how clear it is? God has said, yes, it's right or wrong. Murder is in the 90%. If you want, oh, God, should I murder my neighbor? That's ignorance. You say, well, Bill, those are so obvious. Yes, I'm telling you there's more that, are, that is obvious than you're willing to admit. If you're trying to find a workaround, what you think is God's will or word from the times that are tested, from the teachings that are tested with the, 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 the history behind them, if you're trying to get a push around with those, you should always back up and spend more time with God's word. Because if you're trying to look for a look around, you're most likely looking for something you want. Not necessarily what God wants. And so when you are ignoring the 90% clarity of God, it is going to make your life even more frustrated than what life can be in a world full of sin. God cares about the everyday living. And in his word, he gives you the everyday life way for you to live. The everyday instructions, the everyday guidance, it's right there. It is absolutely right there. Want to do with your, what you want to do with your money? Well, it's in there. What you want to do with your home and how you live your life and how you do your job? It's in there. You don't have to seek God's heart over it. You may need some wisdom as to how to apply what you already know, but you don't need to seek God's heart as to whether God wants you to work hard and for his honor. He says, do all things as unto Christ. And yet some people are going, oh God, how can I honor? Well, show up for work on time. Get a job. Stop laying around the house. That's pretty clear. That's the 90%. See how clear it is? You say, well, I'm all, I'm all mixed up. You don't have to be mixed up. You don't have to. Does God want you to have a job? Yes. Boom. Done. Just like that. Does God want you to honor him in that job? Absolutely. Does God want you to be in friendships? Absolutely. Wants you to be in marriage? Mm. Okay, if he does, then he's already talked about everything that has to happen in that marriage. Over and over again, God has given you 90% of what it takes to breathe, live, and honor him in your everyday life in his word. So number one is the Bible. Number two, prayer. Pray. I know it's a tough gig, and I know sometimes you feel like, man, I'm talking to the ceiling. That's okay. Don't stop praying. Pretend. Just pretend if you have to that it is something you have to do. I know it's a little bit tough, and people don't like that. But listen, what's wrong with discipline? What's wrong with discipline? There's nothing wrong with discipline. When you begin to pray consistently, you'll find yourself consistently praying. 
Matter of fact, you may even find your prayers actually becoming more consistently understandable. And here's something you can do very powerful about prayer. You can write your prayers down. You can journal your prayers. I actually write my prayers out probably 50% of the time or more. That way, and I keep them actually by year. You don't have to do this, but I'm telling you. So if I'm praying about a topic, I, I can go back and say, okay, God, here's the topic. And I was praying about that in 2020. And I go back and say, well, how did I pray about that topic? Or maybe it's something I prayed for. And honestly, if I prayed about a topic for five years in a row, man, I stop and I say, wait a minute. I need to read some more passage of scripture about what I've prayed over and over again for five years in a row. I obviously, am, I need some wisdom here. I need some guidance and some direction. And so write your prayers down. There's nothing wrong with that. So people feel, feel like it's got to be some, you know, out of body experience. And listen, I, prayer can be that. I get it. But prayer most often is like in the garden. It is the hammering down of what has to happen. And between you and the Father, you say, boy, there's some things I want to do. There's some things I don't want to do. But I want to do what you want. And that kind of prayer will get you somewhere. Matter of fact, it'll actually begin to bleed into your Bible reading. You'll be reading the Bible and you go, oh, my lands, there's the answer to my prayer. You might start praying right there. Or you might start doing the third thing which you need to do, I believe, to be able to find God's 90%. So the read the Bible, pray, and then as you're reading and praying, you might actually find yourself in worship. That's right. You might actually find yourself in worship. Pray, read the Bible, pray, and then the third way I think that you can actually begin to drill down into God's heart is in worship. Now, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about worship. Church can be worship, okay? Worship can happen at church. What I'm talking about is the worship you have when you're living your everyday life. I'm talking about an ongoing sense of who God is in your everyday walk and honoring him through your actions. You see, work is worship. Say, well, I don't feel any worship in that. Well, let me tell you something. When you honor God in the things that you do, you're saying, God, I see you as higher than me, and I put you in that position, which worship is. Worship is putting God in perspective in his position and knowing that he is higher than you are, that you give him honor and praise and thank him for being who he is so you can be who you are. Thank him for what he gives you. When thankfulness is a form of worship. It is not, worship is not raised hands. Worship is not an emotion. It can have emotions. It can have raised hands. But you can worship while you're driving down the street. You don't have to have any music on, although worship can have music. But I'm telling you, worship is deeper than just actions and emotions. It is a way of life that says, I will honor Jesus in the way I live. Let me be clear. Worship may or may not be music, may or may not be emotion, may or may not be in a building. Okay? Those things don't make it worship. What makes it worship is who you worship. So read your Bible, pray, worship, number four, fellowship. As iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, 17, so does one man sharpen the countenance of another. Being in interaction with other believers is an absolute. God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. This could be in church. This could be in a small group. This could be in any way. Do I prefer church? Some days. Do I prefer small groups? Some days. I practice all of them. Doesn't mean you have to. All I'm getting at is, is don't, get, don't get pushed around by somebody. Don't get bullied into thinking it's being in church every time the doors are open. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about interacting with believers in a consistent and absolutely intentional way. And being in an interaction with other believers is a way in which God does his work to help you understand his heart. Allow other people to have access to you and have allow, allow you to have access to other people. Consistently have someone who is encouraging you and consistently encourage others. Fellowship with one another. Have the gospel at the core. And the gospel is this, Jesus Christ died for your sins and when he died on that cross, he was buried and rose again. And there's eternal life because you believe what is the truth of history about this man named Jesus. And you place your faith. In other words, you trust and lean on the fact that he has paid all the price for your sins. And you'll honor him in the way you work, and work live, and breathe. That's the core of the gospel. And when you have people around you, you're absolutely going to be seeking the Father's heart as a group if that's your focus, and that's what your fellowship needs to be. 
Every so often, ask your friends and family about something you feel like you have a complete conviction about. I think I need the ABC. Listen, don't get crazy. Don't get crazy. You may need to ask some brothers or sisters, hey, I'm thinking about doing ABC. Do you see that for my life? If you don't see that for my life, help me pray, because I think God's leading me towards it. Maybe we don't see it. Help him have, you know, ask God to help clear that up. Again, the 10%. But the 90% is that fellowship. It's being together with other believers. So we have down four of them. The Bible, prayer, worship, and fellowship. Last, this is the hardest of the five. If you truly want to live in the 90% and you want to have the 90% that is already known about God drive your life, number five, you need to live in humility. That's right. If you're in a sexual sin right now, you need to have the humility to walk away from it and to admit you're wrong. Stop trying to work around God's design for relationships and sex. Stop trying to work around it. If you're in a place where you're doing something illegal in your job or you're taking money from something or taking money from someone, you don't have to seek that out and ask God if it's right. You know it's wrong. Stop trying to find a workaround. Have the humility to admit to God you've sinned. Have the humility to find some people around you maybe to talk to about that sin, to have people praying for you and helping you get back on track. Maybe be accountable to them, but have the humility to be willing to understand that you are not perfect, you are not God, and stop acting like it. Life is not about you. It is about the Savior. Have the humility to admit that and stop acting like the world revolves around you. You don't like your church worship? Don't change churches. Have the humility to let someone worship differently than you. Now, God might have you change churches. I don't know. But you pouting around a worship uh, worship uh, group or, or pouting around a church because you want your way at church? Why don't you get some humility about you? You want to know what 90% is like? Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, seek the well-being of others above your own. Philippians chapter 2, don't take my word for it. Go look at it. Have the humility to shut your mouth. Open your heart and let God's word, prayer, worship, and the interaction of other believers humble you so you will live in a less arrogant way. Humility. God's heart is for you to be a servant. It says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And so if you feel like others got to do for you, whether that's church, work, or whatever, wake up and let God humble your heart. You know, he humbled Paul, he put him in prison. You know, he humbled John, he put him in uh, exile on the Isle of, Ma of Patmos. Yeah, away from everybody else. Christians, you say, well, I can't live the life by myself. Paul did, John did. Listen, there are times and seasons in your life you may have to live the believer's life. You may have to make the 90% the decisions when no one else will. Just stand up and be humble enough to make the decision. and Don't get all pouty and all stood up about it. Humility. You want to live for God? You want to live 90%? Be humble. It'll make you a better Christian when you get over yourself. And then you'll know that He is showing you that because of your humility, you will know who He is. Because someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It will not be you standing up, it'll be you kneeling down. And you'll know the world isn't about you, it's not about me. And you will proclaim along with the followers, believers, and those who have rejected him. All will proclaim this, that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings. And if you want to know the Father's heart, you dig in and do that 90. If you keep doing the 90, you'll find yourself having an unbelievably satisfying Christian walk. And you won't be pouting around talking about things that you shouldn't be talking about and acting in ways you shouldn't be acting. Let me say this in closing. Seek the 90% and the 10% will become much, 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 much clearer. Boy, that's hard stuff, isn't it? Because you already know what's right and wrong, especially if you've been a believer for a while. Why? Because God's written eternity on your heart to begin with. C.S. Lewis calls that the moral law. And he's given you it written down. There's a collection called the books of the Bible. Spend some time with it. Spend some time in prayer. Worship interaction with believers, and humility. And you'll be able to live God's heart every day. And you'll live a much more solid 
an anchored Christian life. I guarantee you. Hey, thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Appreciate the time you've given me for this morning. Appreciate everything you do. Appreciate your encouragement. Thanks so much. Going to let you go. Remember, answer down below, wood, gas, or charcoal. What's your preference for barbecue, right? Y'all take care now. Have a great Friday, especially this amazing, like, <laughs> bleak-looking Friday outside. Yeah. Have a great Friday. Have an amazing weekend. Appreciate y'all. Y'all take care now, okay? Bye-bye.